Good evening, everyone. I'm Claudia Tobin. Welcome to the Royal Drawing School's Summer Conversation and Lecture Series. This evening, we have a special event to mark Refugee Week, a screening of a recorded drawing and sound performance uh, by the Syrian-born and Cambridge-based artist Issam Korbaj, which was created in collaboration with the composer Richard Corston, soprano Jessica Summers, and the Cambridge Gallery, Skettles Yard, Young Gallery, and the Fitzwilliam Museum. Issam created the live stream performance titled Imploded, Burn, Turn to Ash to mark the 10th anniversary of the Syrian uprising on 15th of March, 2021. And it was filmed in Cambridge during the, the lockdown, COVID-19 lockdown, and watched live across the world, coinciding with Issam's display of 366 eye idols created from Aleppo soap at the Fitzwilliam Museum. And those of you who were um, following our, our conversation series uh, during the lockdown last year will remember Issam's fascinating conversation um, around this installation with the poet Ruth Bedell. Uh, but tonight I'm, I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to watch in full Issam's film Imploded, Burn, Turn to Ash uh, together, and that it will be one of many screenings in multiple locations across the world during Refugee Week at a time when refugee crisis uh, globally are very much in our in our minds and, and hearts um, and it's a real honor uh, that we have Issam and Richard uh, joining us uh, in conversation uh, afterwards and that will be an opportunity to hear more about the context um, for the film and and the process of, of making it um, so please to the audience feel, feel welcome uh, um, in leaving comments or asking questions in the Q&A and chat boxes um, so so welcome to you both Issam and Richard there we go, wonderful. Um, I'll just introduce you both a little, a little further and then we'll make a start. So, um, so Issam Korbaj has a background in fine art, architecture and theater design. He was born in Syria and trained at the Institute of Fine Arts in Damascus, the Repin Institute of Fine Arts and Architecture in St. Petersburg and at Wimbledon College of Arts. Uh, but he's lived in Cambridge since 1990 where he's been artist in residence, by fellow and lecturer in art at Christ's College. His works are featured around um, the world in different museums, including the Fitzwilliam uh, and Museum of Classical Archaeology, Kettle's Yard, um, the British Museum and the BNA, uh, Brooklyn Museum and the Venice Biennale, amongst others. Um, and, and those of you who have watched um, the, the BBC's programme, A History of the World in 100 Objects, um, will, will know that um, Neil McGregor, who, who um, was the former director of the British Museum, chose Essam's art, uh, artwork, Dark Water Burning World, as the, the 101st object um, for the series. Uh, Richard, Richard Gorston is a, is a composer. Um, he attended the University of York, the Royal College of Music, and the Scuola Civica in Milan, where he studied with Franco Donatoni. And his music has been heard all across the world, including with the BBC, Symphony Orchestra, the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, um, the Symphony Orchestra Basel, um, and the Nash Ensemble. And Richard is currently Professor of Composition at Cambridge University, and he's described as one of the most courageous and uncompromising artists we have. Uh, so welcome, warm welcome to you both uh, once again. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank um, you. And um, we, we've, we've decided to begin straight away with the film um, itself and then we'll be drawing out the context and some of the inspirations for the film um, for the performance later um, and that's, that's really your opportunity um, the, uh, for the audience also to, to ask questions and engage in this conversation so um, thank you very much and we'll, we'll, we'll be meeting again um, after the film in, a, in, in a, about half an hour. Lovely.
Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing this, this, this incredibly moving um, and powerful performance. Um, in a way, it's difficult to, to, to follow to follow it with more words, um, as, as the poem we've just we've just read and we've heard sung is, is still reverberating and, and speaks so so profoundly. Um, in a way, I feel like <laughs> silence is, is 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 what should follow. Um, but we're we're gathered here to to hear more about the the context and, and the making of, of the of this work too. So, um, Isam you made this piece with the Syrian conflict in mind, of course, um, but but recent events um, have brought the crisis in Ukraine and, and the ongoing crisis, refugee crisis in Europe um, to the foreground. Um, so of course it's it's a performance that speaks to, to displacement and, and conflict across the world. Um, and it's also an act of remembering and, and honoring uh, what might otherwise be be erased. Um, so, so I, I wondered if you might just introduce uh, this context a, a little um, and tell us a bit about how you came to mark the Syrian uprising um, in this particular form. Um, Lovely. Um, thank you, um, Claudia. And it is exactly what you are saying. It is actually even just to revisit it, to re-see it, and re-listening to it is such a very emotional mm. place for me. Even I am the one who made it. And I just feel what a very powerful thing to have the last sounds is just still vibrating in my ears. Mm. Um, the, the whole piece came about actually because <clears throat> I felt I really needed to mark the 10th anniversary of the Syrian uprising. And there is a very interesting timing. It's the 15th of March, 2021, but it's equally 21st of March is the Syrian Mother's Day. So I thought there was something really very powerful about this connection of the two, the 10th anniversary. Um, and what has happened originally, that is, it's all came about, the whole uprising came about because of this children graffiti so and now as as an artist i thought i really need to make sense or a story or narrate this in a way that makes all these issues coming together in a way it's not an easy thing especially during the lockdown i mean this was really all lockdown time and you cannot speak with anybody in person everything has to be communicated so I came up with this idea, I'm going to use, use my poem, which is to do with seeds, which is to do with uh, destruction, which is to do with the, the life of the seed and the life of the refugee. And I thought I needed something really to articulate it in a way, um, very, again, taking a huge risk. There is no rehearsal involved. I don't know the theater. I don't know the dimension. I Even I didn't know now, just watching it, I didn't know if this paper will fit in that, in that, that sock. It's just many unknown, if you like, territories. But I, it felt I needed, regardless, I needed to make the occasion, to mark the occasion, even whatever it cost me, I have to mark the occasion. Um, and luckily, I was working with a group of wonderful people. They were all believing in it. From um, from the team of uh, people in the Heon Gallery, all with, with absolute distance, and with the Downing College, and with Kettle's Yard, and with the Fitzwilliam Museum. Everybody was putting something. And then the spies came because of Richard and Jessica. They came and they made the whole thing somehow they 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 created this blood if you like of going through the whole piece becomes really so rich the way how we hear the sound and the voice so for me of course it is to do with syria but it is not only about syria it it could be read about many current cities that's being being under destruction so now it is 11 years and as you see things we are not learning, things are, many cities are still being distracted and many people are being forced to migrate their own homes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I was just thinking as you were, you know, you were describing that connection with, with Mother's Day, with the, the, the sort of trope of the seed and there's such a sense and, and also the, the making of the work during lockdown and that sense of sort of absence and um, disconnection and and yet the performance itself is so sort of intensely physical we really experience your physicality exhaustion um your movement through space and and there's such a sense of the vulnerability of the body um also and and i just wondered you know the the, the use of the blindfold um that decision you know how did that come about because it sort of in a way accentuates um uh that, that physicality and that, and that power of the body, but also this sort of sense of, um, of vulnerability. Um, and I wondered too, perhaps bringing in Richard also, if if this sort of play or manipulation of the different senses or the deprivation of different senses, if, if how that sort of fed into or shaped your your composition, because we don't see Jessica Summers, the soprano, do we? We, we, we hear her voice and the focus is on her voice and on the words, but perhaps, yeah, I would, I'd, I'd be interested to hear both your thoughts. Um, as far as not seeing uh, Jessica is concerned, I mean, one thing I can say is that the, um, the first line of the poetry, which was set to music, was sweltering desert. And um, I had this very, very intense sense of heat haze. And, you know, are we seeing one person, are we hearing one voice or are we hearing many voices and how this one through the water of the eyes, um, one, one person can turn into many people or can become somehow blurred. So there was a sense uh, and, and it is Jessica's voice all the way through, but multi-tracked and stretched and transformed to become a kind of collective thing. It becomes a whole crowd of, crowd of voices. So, um, there was a sense of all of those things kind of working together a little bit in 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 my imagination as well. Mm. Yeah, and that sense of sort of repetition in the drawings um, and in in the mark making, and then the sort of echo and reverberation of the, of the voice and the the bells tolling or the bell like sounds tolling. I, I'm not sure exactly what you were using that, but um, yeah, that 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 sense of connection between the the visual, the oral, um, was really was really powerful. Um, May I just add something? Yeah. Because this was really quite a very deliberate decision mm. about being blindfolded. I was actually at the time working with the Fitzwilliam Museum on my eye idols, mm. and I sculpted them blindfolded. I sculpted them with with uh, Aleppo soap. So the uh, concept of being blindfolded was part of my thinking at that time. But equally. I was actually, if, if you analyze a little bit of more what behind the scene, I was actually, to start with, I was acting with my left hand. Oh. I am the child. Mm -hmm. I am the child who is blind, who is working with the left hand because this, I am right-handed. So this is the child, this is the adult. So I was playing with the relationship between the child and the adult in my performance. So the child was innocently making these marks on the wall. And suddenly the adults, the adults, the authority adults came to erase them and not only erase them, destructs the whole ethos behind actually raising one's voice. So the concept for me is definitely the physicality of it because it is um, I mean, the, the memory of these people and these young adults, that is, they dare to raise their voice. I felt I need to commemorate them. But equally, I was drawing many, many eye idols, many of these eyes. I was repeating and repeating and repeating. And it's very beautiful what I hear Richard saying. This is one of the things that is we were discussing, that it has, where is the voice, where is the sound is going? And actually, we both agreed on the sweltering desert. That will be the ideal, ideal entry point, is the repetition of these voice uh, sounds. And uh, the actually exactly very beautifully said by Richard is that kind of vibration of what you are looking at and what you are hearing so the sound 
reflected very beautifully what has just presented on on form of shapes and um, and drawings. But I, again, actually, what I wanted to say, um, Claudia, that mm. many of these elements were accidental mm. from my perspective. Is just what I mean by accidental because there is many unknown. Mm. I could have easily take the whole thing outside and it was have been it could have been raining but actually there is many of these um if you like it was pure coincidence that things worked from one chapter to another chapter to another chapter um but of course thanks to many mind and hands behind the piece mm. Yes, because I, I, I was um, there was such a sound world, isn't there? Even in the first half of the of the performance, before we we hear Richard's composition, and you know, I was just really struck by the the sound quality of you know the the scraping, the the scratching, the the kind of rhythmic quality, almost the sort of staccato you know um, effects, and and that sort of ripping of the paper towards the end of that of the first part, which is almost sort of pa a painful sound to hear. So. Um, and then also the silences and, and the, the pauses, which then um, I think shape, somehow shape our reading of the poem later later on. Um, so I, I suppose many of these things you were thinking about, but also they, they came together, um, they sort of unfolded um, in the process of, of, of creating the work itself. Um, I just want to just to to pause there just to 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 welcome anyone listening you know do feel feel free to to, to write any um questions you have in the chat or, or q a box um just to, to remind you you're welcome to kind of join us too um may i just add something here claudia although i said many things accidental but actually it has taken many discussions what one of the things for example the poem is 366 lines so i left it with Richard and Jessica to choose which part that speaks to them. Right. And that was a really very powerful decision. The minute they made that choice, it made the action of the fire becomes much more, the connection of the two parts was much stronger. So although I do believe actually in the question of one needs to take things with the flow, one needs to play with what is available. There was many thinking behind it, not necessarily rehearsing it, but thinking about it. And actually, I mean, I don't know if you notice the 10 bells mm. was very powerful reminder of the 10th anniversary was really, I mean, we were talking earlier about the question of time and I feel definitely Richard speaks about time as a composer. I have speak about time in a slightly different way. Um, the transformation from my drawing to become an ash, the ash that becomes a memory of the past, but ash that is could become a brick to commemorate the future. So this is the way how I was using it. Uh, would would I be able to ask Richard maybe to reflect on the issue of time, if if I may? Well, yeah. I mean, we we were talking about this earlier. As a composer, musicians are always thinking about time, and I and I suppose in a way, what we're doing is kind of approaching time in a sort of architectural way. Um, and I think of uh, I think of visual art as you know something that that is. It's made in time, but when when you see it in the gallery, it is simply there, and it's fascinating to see this performance, to see Isam's performance uh, as a is a time based art art form, and it and it, it goes it moves out of being visual art into something else. And I was also struck by how a two dimensional um, writing and drawing becomes a three-dimensional thing when it's destroyed and and stuff that sack um almost it almost made me think of a, a body a body bag or something like that in it, it's so there's there are lots of sort of links uh between all of these things i suppose the time is another kind of dimension as well lovely thank you 
Yes, and just just following on from that, I wondered about the choice of a soprano, about the register that you you kind of envisaged for the for the, for that work. Was no. I was I was I was very happy, um, but I was also using what was to hand <laughs> because we were under lockdown. So my wife is a soprano, and oh. she she has been um, absolutely passionate about. Um, issues to do with refugees uh, for many, many years. She worked for the British Red Cross and she's worked with Safe Passage and the Cambridge Refugee Action Group. Um, and so, well, also we couldn't go out. So it was very, very difficult um, to, to work with other musicians. Um, so we, we worked with what we had very, very happily. And I also had at home some bells, which I built for a, a previous piece of music, which were set up. So, um, I didn't need to go to any percussion shop or talk talk to any other, you know, musicians. We could just use what we had, which which worked in a very again. It felt like the pieces slotted into place very very naturally, and it felt like a very happy sort of. Um, it wasn't a frustrating restriction. Let's put it that way. No, it's, it was incredibly haunting, beautiful um, music. Um, I, I, I suppose that there's, there's a sort of following qu on question about materials um, to pose to Issam, which um, also uh, I see in our, um, our audience. Um, there's another question about, about um, materials and, and specifically about the use of, of matches, um, not only in, your, in, in this piece, but in, in your wider practice. And perhaps um, this is from Dan Brown, perhaps he's also thinking of your, your artwork, um, Dark Water Burning World, your boat artwork. Um, which which incorporates sort of clusters of of burnt matches too. So there's it'd be really interesting to yes hear hear more about the, your use of materials. It actually it goes back um, much earlier. There is another piece. It's called Another Day Lost, mm -hmm. which is actually a miniature refugee camp uh, made out of recycled paper and uh, card uh, cardboard boxes and medical boxes and the camp itself is surrounded by a fence. The fence is made out of uh, burnt matches and the amount of burnt matches reflect the amount of the days since the Syrian uprising. Hence, this is why it's called another day lost. Mm. So the idea of the, the giving birth of that light and the dying of the light, so each match represented one day. Now, I developed this idea of the matches to a totally different meaning. When I did another performance, I did nothing but burning these matches, and it's called strike. So the, the, the match becomes a, a reflection on the barrel bombs in Syria. So although it's the same object, but putting it in a totally different context becomes a different meaning. Once it was counting the days, this becomes to becomes when I play with this strike, it becomes a barrel bomb. And then when I planted them inside my refugee, my, my dark water burning wall, they become a traumatized people. So the, what I am really interested as a visual artist, that is the context is always the case. It is where you put things and how they speak. So when it came about this particular uh, performance, I felt I needed, I just did not want to create a graffiti. I wanted to burn it because I felt that is, there is the canvas or, or if you like, the material is coming from Syria is so rich canvas for an artist to dip into and play with. So I felt that the idea of burning is the most obvious thing. And of course, as you know, destruction in art is a very important part of movement. And I felt that is, I am following the footsteps of many giants. That is the idea of burning things and they become, so the piece becomes now in a form of ash. I feel now the ash is the piece, but it, until where it's traveling, until where it came about, it is, this is what is hidden in the DNA of this ash. Thank you, thank you. 
Um, I suppose following on from that, I mean, we, we touched on this in conversation just a bit earlier, but thinking about how this performance might have altered or, or changed in its in its different contexts. And, and I think you mentioned on one occasion it's going to be or it has been screened on a on a church altar. I'm sure there are there's a sort of a variety of, of, of locations. And it would be interesting just, yes, to hear your, your reflections on that and, and, and what that does in terms of scale, because this, you know, this drawing is, is it, it's, a, it, it's a, on, a, on a great scale. Um, and and it'd be, yes, it would be interesting to hear, to hear. I absolutely, exactly what it is, it is uh, thinking about when you go to the cinema, what kind of scale you see things and what kind of... Uh, Audio, uh, audio you hear, the sculptural sound you hear, it is exactly what I experienced in Newcastle University. I went to visit them and in the cultural lab, I had the privilege to be in that space, in that scale. It has totally different impact even on me seeing it in that scale. Um, the few years back, actually, I, I was working with Great St. Mary's Church because I know that is, they have um, an immigrant theologian, um, Ash, is buried in the altar of Great St. Mary's Church. And actually, one of my performances, Strike, the finished product, I actually exhibited in the altar. So I know that is, there is that context that is I want to play with. And of course, burying Ash and memories it is what what is a better place than than the churches so i actually contacted many churches around the world and i was really touched by their responses so the one actually in great St. mary's church it is a screen but it is of course you cannot escape but by listening and hearing and looking at the stained glass at the same time there is the contradiction of the beauty of the place and the horrible thing that is one is seeing of this destruction but this is what is art you need to charge the place by creating this um this contradictions and this is what i feel that is definitely it is a i would love to have a telephone box to show it in a telephone box and that kind of and see what kind of acoustics might create but it is this is this is or projecting it in a in a, a massive scale what kind of uh, the scale what kind of it could could contribute to the piece um, but uh, please do have a look at uh, i'm asking everybody on online that is there is about 16 locations around the world is being currently screened uh, physically and another 13 online but if you have the chance to see it physically you will see the difference actually being in a in a space so thank you for this question, Claude. Thank you, thank you. Well, I, I'm afraid we, we we have to draw to a close um, here, but um, but I think that in a way that's a good note to end on because it would be so it'd be a fascinating kind of continuation or meditation on on this performance to think about it in in these different contexts and to kind of follow its journey um, through this week um, in particular. Um, but I want to thank you, thank you both for, for, for sharing your, your thoughts and reflections on, on the process of, of making this performance. And it's, it's been incredibly moving and, um, and um, poignant to, 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 to mark um, Refugee Week um, by, by screening this, uh, this sound and, and graphic um, performance. So thank you both. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you very much. And if thank I you. may just remind everybody that is, this is the Refugee Week and it's to do with healing. And many refugees actually, they come with their traumas and it is uh, the best thing to give refugees is not homes, but warmth. Warmth of a human touch, of a human connection. And this is very important to remember that we are doing it for this occasion. Thank you. And thank you for your insight, Richard. It's lovely to hear your stories about the bed. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Please do pass our thanks to, to Jessica, too, because she couldn't. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And, and Hassan, thank you for that. Um, that ending ending note for a call a call for healing which is what we what we all hope for um, particularly this week as we as we remember refugees thank you thank you Claudia and thank you everybody behind the scenes